7.1 vectors as forces. When we think of force, we usually think of it associated with effort or muscular exertion. Okay, experience when an object moves from one place to another. So examples of force, pulling a toboggan, lifting a book, shooting a basketball, and pedaling a bicycle. From these examples, we can see that force can either be something that pushes or pulls an object. Okay, so pushes or pulls. When a large enough force is applied to an object at rest, the object moves. And when, the, when a large enough force is applied to an object in motion, the force will change the motion in which the object is moving. Okay, so it might change the direction, it might go faster, it might go slower, whatever it is. So let's talk about force as a vector. Force is a vector with both a magnitude and a direction. And all vector properties that we've studied thus far apply to these forces. So definition of force. The product between the mass of an object, it has to be in kilos. Okay, so don't allow it to like say pounds, you'd have to convert. Okay, so the product between mass in kilos and the acceleration due to gravity. So acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. So a quick example of this is if a one kilogram mass exerts a one kilogram times gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. So that would be 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, force uses the unit of measurement newtons. Okay, so this is not meters per second squared. This is newtons, 9.8 newtons. Because of the Earth's gravitational field, which acts downward, we say that a one kilogram mass exerts the force of 9.8 newtons. And a person of 60 kilos mass exerts 60 times 9.8, which is 588 newtons on the surface of the Earth. Okay, resultant in composition of forces. The issue in real life situations is that most of the time, more than one force is acting on an object. The resultant of several for forces is the single force that can be used to represent the combined effect of all the forces. Okay, so we've been talking about the resultant, it's the combined effect of all the forces. Okay, all the vectors. The individual forces that make up the resultant are referred to as the components of the resultant. Okay. And equilibrium of several forces. The equilibrium of a number of forces is the single force that opposes the resultant. Okay, so for example, if the resultant goes this way, this here would be the equilibrium. Let's call it vector E. Okay, it opposes the resultant of the forces acting on an object. When the equilibrium is applied to an object, this force maintains the object in a state of equilibrium. Okay, in real life, the equilibrium force is important to stop the movement of an object. Example one. Two children, James and Fred, are pushing on a rock. James, so there's going to be some rock, okay? James pushes with a force of 80 newtons in an easterly direction. So if we're thinking never eat shredded wheat, okay, in that direction. So we're going to the east. So James pushes this with 80 newtons of force. And Fred pushes with a force of 60 newtons, but in the same direction. So we can write the 60 here. On the 60, the vector is going to be just a little bit shorter than the 80, of course. So determine the resultant and equilibrium of these two forces. Okay, so if you think about 60 newtons to the east and 80 newtons to the east, the resultant, let's go, is going to be the 60 newtons plus the 80 newtons. going to the east. Let me put E in there. Okay, so we get 140 newtons going east. That's going to be the resultant. Now, what's the equilibrium? 
So in order to combat both Fred and James, we would need an equilibrium in the opposing direction of the 140 newtons. So we can say equilib equilibrium is going to be 140 newtons, but in the west direction. Oh, I'll just put west. So this example one involved two collinear forces, but in nature, this is uncommon when trying to move an object. Okay. It's more common to see two forces acting on an object that are not collinear. Okay. We use previous skills to determine the resultant when we place the vectors head to tail. Again, we can either we can use either the parallelogram or the triangle law. Right? These are interchangeable. As we can see, the resultant force is denoted by F. So let's denote this. The resultant is vector f, and the equilibrium is denoted by negative f or e. So we can either call this e, but because it's in the opposite direction, we can also call this negative vector f, okay? Sorry, or vector e. So vectors in a state of equilibrium. So resultant and equilibrium of the force vectors f1 and f2 okay so if f1 looks like this and f2 looks like this and we pick up f2 because we don't want it tail to tail we want it tail to tip tail to tip okay tip to tail so pick it up finish our parallelogram or finish our triangle and what's going to be our resultant this right here, this red, this is going to be our resultant. Okay, so this resultant would be F, I uh, can't see it anymore here, but this is going to be vector F1 plus vector F2. Okay, and that's the resultant. Capital, like vector capital F. Now, when we talk about the equilibrium, we're going in the opposite direction. So same magnitude, opposite direction. So this is either called the equilibrium, which is vector E, or it's the opposite of vector F, which is negative vector F. Okay, so these two diagrams are the same. They're showing the same thing. One is using the parallelogram, and one is just using the triangle. So when three non-collinear vectors are in a state of equilibrium, they can be drawn head to tail so that the result is a triangle since the resultant of the two forces is opposed by the third force. In this, we have vector A, vector B, and vector C are in equilibrium such that vector C is the equilibrium. Then what happens is negative C equals a plus b or a plus b plus c equals zero as you can see if we just bring over the c and it becomes negative vector c these two equations are the same okay or in other words ne uh, negative vector c plus vector c equals zero because if we had negative vector c which is a plus b then this right here would stand for negative vector C and we would get zero regardless. Okay, forces in equilibrium. So vector A plus vector B plus vector C. So vector A, it looks like this, vector B looks like this, vector C returns to the start. These are three non-collinear forces. Okay, what does this look like when forces are equal in equilibrium when they're collinear? So vector A goes this way, plus vector B going this way, plus vector C going in the opposite direction. And then it's going to end where it started. 
So example two, two forces of 20 newtons and 40 newtons are acting, act at an angle of 30 degrees to each other. So we're going to go 20 newtons, okay, we're going to go 40 newtons, a little bit longer, and they act at an angle of 30 degrees. Determine the resultant of these two forces. Okay, so we've seen this before. The difference now um, is just that we're dealing with newtons and forces. So we're going to go ahead and pick up this 20 newtons, and we're going to put it here so that we go head to tail, and we're going to draw our triangle. So I'm going to draw a triangle on the side just to clean this up. So we're going to have 40 newtons. We're going to have 20 newtons. And then our resultant is going to be this one right here. This is going to be our capital vector F. Okay, so I'm going to take in a parallelogram. There's 360 degrees. Okay, this accounts for 30 and this accounts for 30. So I'm going to subtract 30, subtract 30, and I'm going to get 300 degrees. So between this angle here and this angle here, these two are going to add up to 300 degrees. That means that because these are equivalent, each one of these is 150 degrees. So now going back over to our diagram, we get 150 degrees. Okay, so how can we solve for so the side vector f? So vector f is going to be, this is going to be cosine law. Okay, 20 squared plus 40 squared minus 2, 20, 40, cos 150. Okay, so 20 squared is our 400, um, 40 squared is our 1600, minus 2 times 20 times 40 is going to be 1600, cos 150. So we have 400 plus 1600 minus 1600, cos 150. Make sure that you're in degrees. And I get... 3385.64. I'm sorry, I'm going back up here. This is vector f squared. Because at this point, we can square root both sides and then we can get vector f. Okay, so I get 58.2. Let's just round to 58. So 58 newtons. Okay, so now let's find the angle here. Okay, so if we have 40, 150, 20, and then we have 58, we can use sine law because these two match up, and then we can find this angle using the 20 newtons. Okay, so we're going to have, we're finding an angle, okay, sine of 150 over 58 equals sine of theta over 20. Okay, cross multiply this up. We're going to put 20 sine 150 over 58 into our calculators. Okay, and we're doing this in degrees. Sine 150 divided by 58. Okay, so I get 0 decimal 1724 and so on equals sine theta. To get rid of the sine, we're going to sine inverse both sides. So that goes away, and we get zero equal, or sorry, theta equals nine decimal nine. Let's just round to 10 degrees. So this one's 10 degrees. Therefore, vector F, which is the resultant vector, is 58 newtons, and X at an angle of 10 degrees, two, and like the 40 newton vector. See this one right here? To the 40 Newton vector. Here's the thing. We never made um, a compass like, you know, like the never eat shredded wheat. We never made this. We don't have any information about this. So all we can do is quote the angle of the resultant in terms of like the angle to either the 40 Newton or the 20 Newton vector. 
resolving a vector into its components. So resolution means taking a single force and decomposing it into two components. This can be done infinitely many ways and infinitely many parallelograms can be created. The easiest way to resolve forces is to resolve them into a horizontal component and a vertical component that are at right angles to each other. So if we're given some uh, force, we can say this is a combination of this horizontal force here and then this vertical force here. That's all that means. Okay, and then theta is always going to be between our force and the x-axis. So we resolve a vector f by drawing a vertical line from the head of the x-axis and the horizontal line from the head of vector f to the y-axis. Okay, so independently, this is the horizontal force and then this is going to be the vertical force. Those are independent. Of course, we would have to pick one of these up, rearrange it, um, tip to tail, that's it, and then we'd have our triangle. Okay, so the new forces OD and OE can be seen above, and of course OD is horizontal, OE is the vertical component. So to calculate the magnitude of OD, we use the cosine ratio in the right triangle. OAD. So when we talk about this right triangle, we're talking about OAD here. So in this triangle, obviously cos is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? As soon as we talk about right angles, we're thinking SOHCAHTOA. So if we have the magnitude of vector OD over the magnitude of vector OA, then we can just rearrange this. We can just cross multiply this magnitude of vector OA up. So then we get magnitude of vector OA cos theta equals the magnitude of vector OD. Okay, being the horizontal component. Okay, and that's all that this says. This means that the vector OD, the horizontal component of vector OA, has the magnitude of the magnitude of vector OA cos theta. Okay, the magnitude of the vertical component is likewise the same thing, okay? So the vertical component is OE. So now in this triangle here, which is OEA, this is one in blue, okay? So if you think about it, whatever theta is here, this right here is going to be 90 minus theta. Because no matter what, these two are going to be complementary. They're going to add up to 90 degrees. Now, cosine is going to be the same, adjacent over hypotenuse. This time, adjacent is going to be OE. Hypotenuse is still going to be our vector F, which is OA. Okay, and then again, rearrange, and it's going to be the same thing. So cross-multiply this magnitude of vector OA up, and then we can state that the magnitude of vector OE equals the magnitude of vector OA sine theta. Okay, so let's relate this cos 90 minus theta sine theta, okay? We remember these right here. So cos 90 minus theta is going to be sine of theta. Okay, we learn these in functions and if you think about it logically. Okay, we have some right angle triangle and I'm just going to draw it like this. Okay, so if this is theta, this is 90 minus theta because this is 90. All three of these add up to 180. So as to theta, this is opposite, this is adjacent, and this is hypotenuse. But if we're looking at it from the 90 minus theta, this would be opposite, this would be adjacent, 
and then hypotenuse of course stays the same. So if we think about the cos of 90 minus theta, which is right here, cos is going to be, let's call this x because it's going in the x direction, let's call this y because we're going in the y direction, and let's just call this r because it's the resultant. Okay, so cos of 90 minus theta is going to be y over r. And then likewise, sine of theta, which is going to be the other one, one right here, sine of theta is going to be opposite, which is y over hypotenuse, which is r. So these two are actually going to have the same ratio. And that's why we swapped it straight out. Okay, so replacing vector OA with vector F, we see that vector F subscript X, right, this would be going in the X direction, this would be your horizontal force, okay, equals the magnitude of the vector F cos theta and the magnitude of vector F subscript Y, and of course, y is going in the up down, like the vertical. It, this is going to be the vertical component. It's going to be the magnitude of vector f sine theta, where f subscript x vector represents the horizontal component, and f subscript y, like the vector of, represents the vertical component. Okay, resolution of a vector into horizontal and vertical components. If the vector f is resolved into the respective horizontal and vertical components, which is vector fx plus and vector fy, then the magnitude of, f, of vector f at fx equals the magnitude of the force cos theta and the magnitude of vector fy equals the magnitude of the force sine theta, where theta is the angle that F makes with the x-axis, okay? And all this means here is that when we draw these, we have to draw them to the x-axis, because that's going to be our theta. So example three, Caleb pulls a rope attached to her sleigh with a force of 200 newtons. So if you're thinking about a girl pulling her rope, but she's going this way, right? So her rope's going to be here, the ground's going to be here, and then her sled's going to be here. Okay, so when we talk about this 200 newton force, we're talking about this right here. So then it says if the rope makes an angle of 20 degrees with the horizontal, the horizontal we can accept as like the ground. So let's go 20 degrees determine a the force that pulls the sled forward so in other words f vector fx okay and we'll find the magnitude of that and then the force that tends to lift the sleigh so if you think about it she has to lift it enough that it can slide so that's going to be the vertical component okay vector fy okay and then this is just vector f so if you think about Sokotoa, okay, you don't need to memorize any of those equations. We can just say, okay, this is opposite, this is adjacent, and this is hypotenuse. So in order to find fx, we are going to do adjacent over hypotenuse. So we're gonna go cos 20 equals the magnitude of fx over 200. And we just cross multiply up 200 cos 20, and that's gonna be the magnitude of the horizontal force. So I get the horizontal force has magnitude of 180, let's round, eight newtons okay now let's figure out the vertical component 
So the magnitude of the, uh, the vertical force. Okay, what is this going to look like? So we have this angle here. We have opposite and hypotenuse. So we're going to use sine. So sine 20 equals the magnitude of the vertical component over 200. Okay, we can cross multiply that up and we get 200 sine 20 equals and that's going to give us the magnitude of that vertical force. So I get the magnitude of the vertical force equals 68 newtons. So we can say the horizontal force is 188 newtons and the vertical force is 68 newtons okay think of this as say you have an object the sled somebody's pushing it to the right at a certain force and then somebody's actually lifting it up and then the vector f is going to be our resultant. Example four, a mass of 20 kilos is suspended from a ceiling. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and draw the ceiling by two lengths of rope that make angles of 60 degrees and 45 degrees with the ceiling. So there's going to be some rope here, and this is going to make the angle of 60 degrees with the ceiling. There's going to be some rope here, and this is going to be 45 degrees to the ceiling, not drawn to scale. Okay. And this says determine the tension in each of the ropes. So let's just call this tension one and let's call this tension two. Now at the bottom of these two ropes, there is a 20 kilo weight that's hanging. So if you think about the force, this is not 20 kilos as a force. If you think about the force, let's call this force downward. Okay. Remember, it's going to be the 20 kilo times 9.8 meters per second squared because of gravity. So we actually have a downward force of 196 newtons. So this is 196 newtons. Okay, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the 180 minus to solve for this angle. So I get 180 minus 60 minus 45. And I get 75 degrees. So this here is 75 degrees. Okay, because these are forces, we can draw these arrows going up. Okay, so we may not need the 75, but we have to redraw this because right now they are tail to tail, these two vectors. So I'm going to redraw this vector T1, or sorry, T2. Okay, and if you think about it, this is here is going to be 60 degrees. Now I'm going to pick up this vector T1 and I'm going to place it tail to tip tip to tail and I'm going to draw it like this and we're going to call this T1 okay and if you think about T1 here this would be 45 okay and if we use the Z pattern okay from back in grade 9 so Z would be here okay but I won't leave that on the screen then this also is going to be 45 degrees. So what does that do? That gives us an angle of 105 degrees. And this is going to be our resultant force or our resultant tension. Okay, so this is going to be T1 plus T2. Okay, and this is also going to be 45, this one's going to be 30, because no matter where this is, if we do the Z pattern, 
this is going to be 60. So then this inside is 30. And again, the Z pattern, this is going to be 45. Okay. We can see the Z here. 45. Okay, so taking a look at this, how are we going to solve T1 plus T2? So we know that T2 is across from 45. So let's go the magnitude of vector T2 over sine 45 equals, okay, T1 is across from 30. So magnitude of vector T1 over sine 30. And we're just using the sine law. And then the last one is going to be the magnitude of vector T1 plus vector T2 all over sine 105. Okay, so these three ratios are all going to be the same. So because we had 196 newtons move, going downward, okay, on these two tensions, this is actually our resultant, 196 newtons. So this up here, we're going to change this to 196 newtons. Okay, so when we do sine law and we have three ratios, we just want to use two at once. So let's, let's solve for T2, and we're going to use the full ratio that we have. So we have the magnitude of vector T2 over sine 45 equals 196 over sine 105. And I'm going to take this sine 45, and I'm just going to bring it up. So the magnitude of vector T2 is 196 sine 45 over sine 105. So the tension on T2 is going to be 143 newtons. Okay, let's do the same thing, but let's do it for T1. So the magnitude of vector T1, I'll put it here, over sine 30 equals 196 over sine 105. Okay, so the sine 30 cross multiply up and we get the magnitude of vector. So let's go 196 cross multiply sine 30 all over sine 105. And we get 101.45, so let's just say 101 newtons. Okay, so then we can say therefore tension one the magnitude of tension 1 equals 101 newtons, and the magnitude of tension 2 is 143 newtons. Okay, example 5. Is it possible for three forces of 15, 18, and 38 newtons to keep a system in a state of equilibrium? If you think about a triangle and you think about, okay, so maybe it's like 15 here and then 18 here, okay, well, what's 15 plus 18? So 15 plus 18 is 33. This is less than 38. So there's no way to configure the 15 and the 18 so wide enough that it's going to achieve 38. So we can say, therefore... This is not possible to keep a system of equilibrium. B. Three forces have magnitudes of 3, 5, and 7 newtons are in a state of equilibrium. Calculate the angle between the two smaller forces. So, for example, if this was maybe, I'm going to go 5 newtons, 3 newtons, and then 7 newtons. I actually did it like this because I like the angle that I'm using to be in this corner here. Okay? So, if you think about this, we have three side lengths. How do we find this vector, or sorry, this angle theta? I'm going to say, let's call this force one, let's call this force two, 
vector force two, and let's call this vector force three. So we're going to use the cosine law. So we're going to go force the magnitude of force three, and you know what? Let's put magnitudes here. Okay, squared equals the magnitude of force one squared plus the magnitude of force two squared minus two times the magnitude of force one, the magnitude of force two, cos theta. So let's sum all of these Newtons in. We get seven squared equals magnitude of force one, five squared minus plus three squared minus two, five, three, cos theta. Okay, so 7 squared is 49. I'm going to bring over the 5 squared, so minus 25. I'm going to bring over the 3 squared, so minus 9. Okay, and then this is going to equal, I'm going to plug this into my calculator, negative 2 times 5 times 3 is negative 30 cos theta. Okay, at this point, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 30. So, 49 minus 25 minus 9, this is 15. So we get 15 over negative 30 equals cos theta. So this is negative 0 0.5 equals cos theta. Okay, and then if we were to cos inverse both sides, I get theta equals 120 degrees. Okay, so originally we should have drew these vectors with the 3 and the 5. And then kind of like the resultant would be 7, which is fine. Okay, so 3 newtons, 5 newtons, 7 newtons. So when we actually solve for this angle and we got 120, obviously not drawing a scale, 120 is going to be um, larger than 90 degrees. It's going to be obtuse. But what happens is we then pick up the 3, we draw it tip to tail, and then I would do my 360 minus 120 minus 120, and then take whatever that equals and divide it by 2. Okay, so we would get 120 divided by 2, which is 60. So the angle between 5 newtons and 3 newtons is 60 degrees.